I know everyone that has been on camera so far. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Aren't leather workers neat folks? And I promise you, they're like this no matter where you find them in the world. They really are. It, it's this hobby that brings us together. We, we instantly have something in common, don't we? We instantly have something in common. And I know why all of these folks need so much help, because I see they all learned from you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good word. <laughs> Nobody is sacred. <laughs> Nobody is sacred. <laughs> Usually those end up coming back at me, so I know y'all are loading your guns, aren't you? <laughs> the video's not over yet. <laughs> oh my. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> y'all done babbling or are you just goofing off? Yes. I'm not done babbling with mine. I had to stop for a minute, but oh, we're going to stop. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, I do have all this done, and I'm going to bevel these others out here, which are pretty quick and pretty easy. And then, believe it or not, it actually finishes up pretty quick after that. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're in great shape. You know how that free thing up there and free class with the kids started? The reason it even started? Way back when, uh, that uh, the Leather Crafters and Saddlers Journal used to also do a show out in Pendleton, Oregon. And I really have never had a problem getting people to show up at my classes. They usually quite often are sold out. That's not an issue. And so I'm out at Pendleton, Oregon, and I think I was doing a class on figure carving or something like that. I don't even remember what it was. but. It was sold out. I had probably 30 people in the room. It was, it was, there was it, all the tables were full and such. And this lady walks in, and she had uh, like three kids with her, I think it was. And she said, "It's an honor if my kids watch it. Uh, we're there in 4-H, and I, uh, I was just wondered, you know, we, we weren't going to take the class, but it would be all right if we just watched what you guys are doing." And I said, "Well, yeah, of course." So now, in fact, we, I had a table. They'd give me a table all myself. I said, "Yeah, if you guys want to sit right here, you can." And when I get done using the tool, she said, "Here, want to try it?" You know, I'd let them use my tools to do it. Is how it was going. And back then, uh, uh, Bill Reese was the guy that owned the magazine, and. Of course, his daughter runs it now, but Bill Reese comes in, and, and he uh, was looking around, saw these people there, and he ran them out. He, he, he made, made them leave. He said, you guys can't be in here. you got to leave. And, oh, my gosh, did that hit me wrong. Because um, I kind of come undone, uh, you know. Basically, I said, what in the hell are we doing here if we can't show kids how this craft works? What is, what, where's your, where, where's your priorities? We're, we're to be passing this on and you just ran out the next generation of leather workers. I mean, you gotta be kidding me, you know? And anyway, for the next probably five years, I wouldn't teach a paid for class at one of his shows. It was only a class that was free for kids. It was the only class that, cool. now they wanted me to show up because people tend to want to come to wherever I'm doing class and such. But anyway, I started doing it. Now it's become an institution. It's the longest running class. I mean, all the classes change up, you know, with interests and such every year. But that class is still the class that has been going on the longest at uh, that show in Sheridan. And it is the class that has always had the biggest attendance. Um, I, it, I, like I said, I'll have on an average 40 kids in there or so. And then, so what I do is I go around and I grab people like this right here that have done a little bit of leather work, and I say, hey, I need you. I need you to come help me. Um, and these folks will come in, and they will. They'll, and I get as much one-on-one -on -one help as I can for these kids, because you know what's most important? That they have some degree of success. When those kids try leather work for the very first time, I want them to walk out of there saying, that's pretty cool. I did that. You know, I want them going out with some sense of accomplishment. And if that means somebody's got to take them by the hand and lead them all the way through that, then then let's do it. You know, that's just what's so important about that. And um, and it it really has. I, uh, I I have no idea how many hundreds I, I have, but I get 
I have been having Tandy, but others have volunteered to sponsor me as well. They want to be a part of that other companies, but uh, I get from them beginner sets of tools and the leather and everything that I use in that class so that when these kids show up, if there's a kid there that has never done this before and this is their first time and they they don't have any leather, like I, I, well, I have a diploma made up, you know, and I have that this made, and I have to autograph it in front of them. And I say, okay, you got to bring me your thing you made and show it to me, um, and then because I have a certificate for you, and so I, I have them show me the the thing that they made, and it's always great, you know, it's it's always it's fantastic, and and then I tell them, okay, uh, before you go though, let me ask you, if you have, do you have your own tools? And most of the time they don't. And I said, well. If you did, would you do a lot more leather work? I mean, would you promise you'd practice and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, but I don't, I don't have those. And I said, all right, here's the deal. If you'll promise that you will practice and you'll come back next year and show me what you've done, I'll give you those tools that you were just using. Oh, my gosh, you think I just gave them a brand new keys to a Cadillac. I mean, for them, it was a big deal. And they, they, So they walk out. The smiles are priceless. I am totally selfish about why I do this. They smile at me. They thank me. They think I am. I hung the moon, you know, because I just got them their own set of tools. But you know what? I've had some of those kids that have come back years later, and I've seen them get the Ann Stolman Award um, for Leathercraft because they got started and stayed with it. There's there's kids now. Well, I started doing that 23, 4 years ago. So there's there's kids that bring in their kids. Kids that I taught are bringing their kids to this class. Wow. Makes me feel old. <laughs> and I'm not, honest, I'm not. You keep saying that. I know. The more you say, does that make it more true? No, I'm oh. just trying to convince y'all. He's trying to convince himself. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Lost for words. Just laugh more. <laughs> all of culture. Yeah. You know, that's the other reason I come here, for all the moral support I get, you know. Because <laughs> I have a very fragile self-image. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, fruit, I know, I know, but you say and then people sure laugh at me, you know, and say, don't, don't, don't look, don't have the camera on me right now. Come yeah, on. Context, yeah. yeah, if you can be saying that, make sure your wife is not in the room. <laughs> <laughs> she will fix that in a hurry. <laughs> so what, what's, what's your next one next year here? When? Where? What? When? When you coming back? Oh my. Y'all are gluttons for punishment, aren't you? I think this was the only weekend I think we came up that was free. Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty booked this year, but. Um, say next year. Honestly, you know, just for the sake of Danny. Yeah, you know, <laughs> to get his students back in the know. <laughs> yeah, I'm scared to do that before I even think about that. You know, you don't know if you can come back that many times. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna get a complex now. Yeah, I can see that. He's over here. I had to prop him up a couple times already. <laughs> Go look on my, whenever y'all have some, nothing better to do, um, go look at my, my website at the gallery on my Elk Track Studio website. Um, there's a lot of stuff on there and it's all things that, most of it all was done in some class somewhere. Um, so, in fact, when we were talking about what are you going to teach when you're up here? <laughs> Well, I don't know what you want to learn. You know, I, I kind of cover a wide range of what I can do, you know, and um, so that was kind of the thing. But, but we decided on this. This is good basic stuff. There's a lot I can share in a pattern like this. So. Kevin did just did a walk by. What's that? 
He's still, he's still hanging out. Who is? Yeah, no, let him come in. We're finishing up Babylon. Ooh. Well, some are. Some are. Yeah, some the, are. The slow ones are. Yeah, I'm not. But. Jim, are you a little running behind? I, yeah. Hey, yo, I gave him a rule right off the bat. I said, there's only a couple rules. Number one is, thou shalt not get ahead of the teacher. I you know. Because uh, I, I already messed them up. Some of them went ahead and did something, and I said, I'm not going to do it like that. I, <laughs> I know number two. Number two is? Don't tool better than the teacher. Well, yeah. <laughs> not a problem. Uh, no, number two, they're part of this, and they've really been failing at this. Um, <laughs> first of all, don't insult the teacher. Uh, That's okay. <laughs> That's, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. The the other one is that, that they're supposed to ask questions, and you know they they don't ask nearly enough. Mm. I know. Because <laughs> I guess what happens is they find out I answer them, and and that. Well, you must be halfway decent at teaching because it even looks like Denny's done half. <laughs> I'll pay you the five bucks <laughs> <You're early. laughs> later. <laughs> what? Oh. You got a raise, Danny? <laughs> you got lunch? Yeah, I got lunch. Four bucks. Oh, did they charge you for your lunch? <laughs> You made that? It's not very fine. No, it's not. I like the fact you've rounded off that nose. That, um, that can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That works. Thank you. Well, it's okay. Everybody starts somewhere. Yeah. We all start at the same place, actually. Not knowing a darn thing about what we're doing. And then we try to figure it out from there. I This is what I started out doing a long time ago. I did nothing but figures. Yeah. I, that's still what I enjoy doing the most, but, you know, a lot of... too. I, oh, I absolutely, I, I like doing the, the 3D stuff like that and like this over here, you know, I like doing that kind of stuff. I got a fish around here somewhere that came out pretty good. I don't know where that's at. No, it was on a box, a round box. I'll have to see if I can't find that. That's really nice. Did you ever have uh, Rob Barr come by and do something? No. But I knew Rob. Yeah, I did too. He, I, he's one that probably made that more popular than anybody because he was doing a lot of classes and stuff around. You know. A lot of people don't understand too that with figure carving, being able to, to dye something correctly helps a. Uh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Uh, getting a, a good coloration in there, and uh, yeah, and, and a lot of folks want to just grab a bottle of something and, and put it on there. Straight out of the bottle, and no, I got did that for as long as I could get away with it when I was first starting. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, learning how to build up colors, you know, one layer on another on another yeah. is is everything. I don't care about my time. Yeah, actually, that old How to Carve Leather book taught me a lot about that. That's a great book. Yeah, uh, you know, if somebody wanted to know what's a good book, to start out with that's still the one I'd point them at because it's got a yeah. little everything in it and it takes you step by step through a lot of it. 
that's, book, so that, that's the great thing about the books that Stallman did is is his illustrations. Even if you couldn't understand tools, or even if the tool numbers don't even apply anymore, the illustrations of how you go from this step to this step to this step will still teach you how to do it. There's always a tool that you. Well, yeah, I've been talking about that. You know, you learn how to make do with what you got. What do you got that'll do that? You know, that's that is correct. That is how you do it. And then yeah, just, you know, you're not getting ahead of me, are you? No, oh. I'm just doing. That. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing you know, what you did with your model. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So, while it's somewhat quiet here, let me show you one more thing. I got one more thing. I I'm done with my beveling, but I'm not really done with my beveling. I got one more thing. Because some of y'all used a, your pear shader to do what I do with a modeling spoon. You notice on the pattern there how it looks like these edges here rolled over. What's a, what's a, a turn back? That's what these are. Turn back is where the edge of a leaf rolls over like that, right? So it doesn't have a square corner, right? It's rounded. It rolls over like that. So I take my modeling spoon and I make sure that that's rounded over. And I, I run that rounding a little further out there so it almost looks like it's concave a little bit. So I, but I don't do the whole thing. I mean, I'm doing it primarily in the center. And then as I work that out, of course, having good moisture and a good piece of leather is really important too. This Herman Oak, you should be able to see that on there. That, see how it's darkening in? I'm getting some burnish with that. But I, I'm, I'm rounding it from here. So right here, it's as deep as I, as I have it beveled or has, as it was cut, but then I round it up. So what you're seeing on, uh, that pattern that looked like pear shading, well, I guess it is kind of pear shading. It is shading, but it's being done with a modeling spoon. And that's how I treat turnbacks. I think sometimes, I've seen people there undercut these on the wrong side, and, and that's just not right. So. so that's how that was done, if you're wondering. Does that look any different? Okay. You understand the why? Why do you do it that way? That's that's really more important. I want you to know why I do it the way I do it. You'd be amazed what you can do with a modeling spoon. Really a handy tool to have in the toolbox and it can get you out of trouble sometimes. Sometimes it's a good eraser. Yeah, that's the closest thing to an unbeveler I've found. <laughs> but it does a, a pretty good job of cleaning things up like that. Of course, the only reason you have to erase things as if you goof up, you know, and I don't do that. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah I, I've got a spot like that, but I'm not going to point it out because, see. I figured if I didn't tell you, you would tell me. Yeah, well, yeah, it's probably better that way because I'll make some scene out of it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> So I got a question. Okay. Everybody always seems to think, well, this perfect leather job. Have you ever done a job where it was absolutely perfect? No. Every, every tool was in the right spot? No. Have you have you ever seen one? Uh, probably not. I, well, I've seen some that I couldn't find error in it. Yeah. Uh, when I've been doing some of that judging, and, and when I'm talking about doing some of that judging, I'm looking at stuff closer than anybody else ever gets to look at some of this stuff. I mean, I get in there and look at every tool impression and so forth, because honestly, at some of the at that level of competition, uh, some of that stuff it's all great. I mean, it, it's all in just wonderful. But you still got to figure out which one's better than the other. So, and you got to have some justification for it. So you look to find that one little thing that they goofed up on so that you can, at least if somebody asks, why did this guy get the blue ribbon and that one not, you can point out that here's that one thing. You got to have some justification for it. So I, I worked sometimes real hard. I, I've, I've went, uh, I, a couple years ago, Barry King and I were both judging this one category. 
and we had some stuff from China come in there that was just out of the world, out of this world. It was fantastic work. And I literally, we had two pieces that we could not, could not find enough on it. And so the, I, I can't remember what we ended up coming down to. We found some little thing that was just crazy. We actually went over and tried to argue that, hey, let's just split first and second here. Let's call both of these first and split the award between the two of them. And nope, they wouldn't let us do that. So you got to pick one. So we did. But man, the kind of stuff that we were nitpicking, I felt so bad about it. I mean, I couldn't do the work I was judging. It was, it, it was, it was incredible. So, uh, no, and have I ever? No, I've never come close. I can take and show you errors on every piece here that I've done. I can show you where I messed up. Uh, but that's, and, and you can too with everything you've done, but other people can't. People look at your stuff and think, oh my God, if I could ever do that, that is so awesome. Um, but, Don't worry about making mistakes. They're, go they're going to happen whether you want them to or not. Yeah, they will. And, and you know, obviously when you make them, though, uh, what did you do? How did that happen? You know, don't do it next time. You know, that's, that's really the important thing. Yeah. Mistakes are a learn part of the learning process. A lot of the people that are, come to my class, well, I, I hate doing that. I'm such a perfectionist. That's what makes you a good leather worker is being having a little bit of that in you. If you could care less whether it was right or not, you would probably not find leather working fulfilling. Um, you do have your first piece of work at home. Yeah, I have the one that mom saved. That little piece of belt strip, and it's pretty bad. <laughs> and I've got other stuff that is, yeah. What happens, I think, is your work gets crisper. One of the things I get asked all the time, in fact, I, one of my most popular videos that people buy all the time from me is the one on Beyond the Basics, where just I go through some of these little things, like what I'm showing here now about how you round off turn backs and stuff like that, the modeling spoon, and using a hair blade over some of the stems and things like that. Little stuff that is not going to come in some instruction book somewhere. I go through that kind of stuff and, and more. I mean, there, there's a lot more in that, but um, that's, that's one of the most popular ones to do, uh, for me to do. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that's easily overlooked. Uh, it, it may be one of the more popular because there's a lot of people that that want to do perfect leather work. They they all want to do that, and so they think there's some secret, but it really isn't. You just got to do it. So essentially, with that modeling tool, you're just widening out that groove. Well, widening it out, but also. Uh, rounding it so that it rounds from this edge down here up mm -hmm. onto the top. So I want this to look like it's rolled over there like that. So, so that's essentially what I'm doing there. Are you seeing kind of as you're doing that? Do you visualize like a Sheridan ridge in the middle of that roll? No, because Sheridan's not allowed on this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is no ridge in the middle of it. This here, this rolls from the lowest point here to the highest point here. So it okay. is a. A roll. So you're, so you're trying to roll it the whole way. Yeah, it's, it's this just is a Springfield roll. A Springfield roll. <laughs> no, it's like it's like this. This is a turn back, okay? So it goes from a rounded edge here to a very crisp edge here. This edge is hanging up above here. It's not pressed down there. It's up here. So that's what I'm doing is I'm, I'm rolling this here so that I got this rounded edge here, but I'm going to want this to stay crisp and hard on this side. So mm -hmm. it, it's a there's no wave in it. There's no, mm -hmm. no wrinkle or anything like that. It's just, uh, just that rounding. Okay. And why do I do that? Well, it's just me being anal. I, I don't. Nobody would notice. Oh yeah. If you didn't do it, and you saw this by the side of, beside the one that you didn't do, you definitely. Notice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would. But anyway, that's that's why I do it. Is is just to make it look as good as I can. So, all right. Huh? 
I'm going to leave well on that alone. If I keep screwing with it, I'm going to make it work. Well, yeah, and that's the other thing. There's sometimes a point where you got to quit, you know. Let's see what you're doing on the rollback. What was I just doing? I just doing? want to see it closer. Sure. Um, well, well, you know over here, what I'm doing here is I'm taking this, this spoon and, and kind of like I did here, rounding this off, but I'm doing that here, but just in particular places. And I'm putting a little more pressure here so that it slopes very gradually around here to this, uh, to this edge here, so that this here edge is still very crisp and very sharp, and this edge is very rounded. And like I was just showing, it's kind of like this right here. This is now a turn back. You got a nice rounded edge here coming up, but this edge here is, 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 is laying up above and off of the other side, so that's why it's crisp and sharp like that. Um, you can do as much of that kind of little finessing with this stuff as you want. But now I'm going to show you one more of those beyond the basic things that I do sometimes, just because, well, I want to show you. So right here, well, on here, and there's probably other places I could do this, but this is a good place to show you. I did a great job. I got this pear shaded, and then I come back and I beveled, and I beveled it really deep, so I got this really crisp edge I was just telling you about. Um, but I don't want it to look like it's a halo there, so I'm going to take and soften this, this shading down into that so that this looks like the shading actually runs down uh, underneath that turn back and doesn't stop out there at a at a nice even distance away from that edge. What kind of tool? A pear shader. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you see what I'm saying here. <laughs> can I use my thumb print? <laughs> yep. You could try, but I didn't bring one, so. You could probably use a, a, a center shader or whatever. What, what am I doing? I, that's probably a better, better question to ask is what am I doing and why am I doing that? And what I'm doing is I'm trying to get rid of that halo. There's a halo around there that makes it look like there's a ditch running right along that edge. And I don't want a ditch there. Uh, I want it to uh, look like it all folds underneath that over, overhang. But you can see here, at, if you do a good sharp bevel, like that, you, you get a very crisp edge there, and that, that's good. I got good depth and everything, but I don't want it to look like like I like my shading stopped that far away from that edge. Does that make sense? I do a lot of these kinds of things to the work that I do, um, just to make me happy. Um, just because that's the way I wanted to to look, just so that it it makes sense to me. You ain't gonna see somebody going into that kind of detail and worrying about little things like that very often in their explanation about this. But you know that's that's the thing I I mentioned. Uh, some others, you know, I never got to meet Al Stolman. And I do have all of the books he ever wrote, and they're fantastic, and I don't know where I'd be with my leatherwork without him. But you know what? I, everything he knew about leatherworking didn't get put in a book. There's stuff like this, these little extra steps like this he did, and every leatherworker has these little things like this they do. That they, It's just not worth writing about or, or explaining, and it's they just do it, you know, and... And I would have loved to have been able to s either sit and watch him do it or, or ask him about it. Do I hear a funny story about Al Stolman? Yeah, Okay. Funny story about Al Stolman. And you all know who George Hurst is? George Hurst was merchandise manager for Tandy Leather for many, many years. Um, Kevin knows him real well. Um, and. Uh, but he uh, was in Fort Worth, and he was basically Al Stolman's boss. He's the guy that worked with Al Stolman to uh, get the, the books created that he did and so forth. So he, the, those, they worked together, and they were both pretty bullheaded, you know. Uh, 
and George still is, uh, although he's and he's still around, although he's failing a little bit. And Stolman's gone, so I can talk about him. Um, but anyway, the story goes that um, it's not a story; it really happened. Um, Al, uh, George Tandy bought a set of saddle dies from Saddle King of Texas when they were going out of business, and they decided to make a saddle kit. And that, so they had these dies that would pre-cut a saddle. And so George made the first sample of this and uh, put all these parts together and everything. And he's pretty proud of it. He built a saddle. You know, it was built from a kit. And so he was up there telling Stolman about, hey, did you see my saddle that I made? You know, and of course, Stolman was a saddle maker. And he was pretty proud that he was, well, like all of us, was the only one that knew how to do any of that stuff right. You know, um, and uh, anyway, so George is up there, and he was basically fishing for a compliment from Stolman, you know, and uh, you know, and Stolman, well, it, you know, it's okay, and he said, no, tell me, you what do you think? And, and he pushed on him enough to where Stolman pretty much got, pardon my language, he got shit full of it, you know, and so he said, well, you could have at least. Uh, could at least bevel the saddle strings. I mean, look at that. That's square edges like that. I mean, hell, it looks half done, you know. It could at least done that. And the next thing George said is, well, I didn't have, you know, what I needed to do that. And at that point, he had hit it. Stolman had hit it. He said, oh, Jesus Christ. And he grabbed his pocket knife out of his, out of his pocket, jabbed it into his bench, and grabbed a string off of there. And he, he pulled it through there like that and said, why the hell couldn't you have done that? And it went just like that, you know. <laughs> Shut him up. <laughs> he didn't get the compliment he was looking for. He didn't exactly get what he was fishing for. Um, but anyway, I, I know that happened, that, but those two had very strong wills, um, and, and they, they had that kind of a relationship, uh, which was good for the leather business because. George pushed Stolman, and Stolman did what Stolman was going to do, but it was with some guidance that without it, we, would, it, we wouldn't have got what we got from him. So, um, so anyway, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great story. He's a, uh, yeah. Y'all done beveling yet? What are y'all hammering on? <laughs> you ready to go on to the next step? Yes. Really? All right. I ought to get finished then, huh? All I'm doing is tweaking this pear shading like I was telling you I do sometimes. Now I got to do it. So what we do next, uh, what I'm going to do next is uh, some uh, veining. veining. I think I'm going to do some veining. What all did I do on this? I can't remember what I did. I put a seed in there, didn't I? Yeah, I guess we could do that. Put some veining there, veining there. Yeah, that's pretty much it. It's just veining. That's about it. There, what, there is a seed impression there. If you have a seed impression, you want to put it in the middle of that scroll you can but it's not a I don't care if you do or don't it, it's not something I always do um, I don't remember I, get, I guess I guess on that original pattern he did yeah he did so that's why I did it um, so a seed impression when I do these I this is not like I'm not trying to put a hole in that seed okay that or in the in that scroll I want this just to be a dimple in there okay I don't want it don't so don't hammer this in like it's a nail set all right well you got ahead of the teacher no 
You got behind. You didn't get ahead. You got behind. I got behind. Oh yeah, hard. <laughs> well, I didn't go all the way through. I can't see daylight. <laughs> so anyway, a light seed impression in the middle of those scrolls. If you want to be consistent with the way Frank Menia did his, would probably be a good thing to do here. And there's only like three places you, that I did that, I think. Yeah, there's three rules. Okay, so that's all I did. So you can put it away now. Um, and then uh, the Vayner tool. That's that. You're going to have to use what you got. I'll tell you what I got and what I'm going to use. Uh, what I'm going to use is uh, well, let's start out. And again, you might want to make sure you're watching this part because, you know, my hands, you've seen my mallet, you know, sometimes things get separated. So, <laughs> All right, so um, let's, let's start here with this file. You can see some of those impressions around there. There are two kinds of veiners that I use there, right? Um, and let me tell you, I'll give you my terminology on them. Let's see what I want to use. That's pretty close to what I used last time. All right, I've got uh, one that's a typical veiner here. This one here is... Uh, Got a, a veiner is a tool that has some teeth uh, around the bottom edge of it. It's long and skinny, and if you don't know what a veiner is, um, talk to Denny. Um, <laughs> you all better. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's good to use him. I, I love having a shill here. Um, anyway, that, the veiner tool I'm using is just a standard one. It's an old craft tool one. Uh, if you're one of those tool number persons, 708 is the number on this one. And, and I'm going to use this around the outside edge of this um, of this uh, uh, flower bud or whatever the center pod yeah is okay. And so I'm going to use it around the outside. But I want you to look at the pattern there before you just like hammer it everywhere. It's not the same length all the way around there. Did you notice that down here at the base of the flower? Am I on camera? I don't know. But down here at the base of the flower, they're pretty long. They reach out there, and they they the curve changes. They, these petals come out and curve down this way, and so the veiner impression comes out and curves that way. And over on this side, they curve the other way, so they actually switch directions right in here. But as you come around, and these here get more distant back behind the pod, you see how those veiner impressions get shorter and shorter. Mine are all four hundreds. <coughs> well, you're set then, because that's what you got. All of those are 400? Different variations of 400. Okay. Well, I have this one. The other one I'm going to use on the other side of that bud. I'm going to use what I call a shell. And this one here is smooth. Well, it's not smooth. It's got lines off of the back of it. But the inside here, there's no teeth. Okay. Back in the olden days when I was learning to do this, they, we used to call those shells. In fact, you go back far enough, they used to call these barkers. You ever heard that before? Anyway. I've been at this a long time. All right, so so starting out with this, I'm going to put these Vayner impressions in here. And yep, it's a pretty firm impression right up close to the, the pod. And then they fade out. So I'm actually probably right in here getting a, an impression that's about half the length of this tool. And it's, it's rotating a little bit as I work around here. They're not all running off of there at the same uh, angle. So as we're going to work around here, and now I'm getting on to the, the next pedal here. They're still pretty lengthy here. But now I'm getting up to where I'm going to start getting them a little bit shorter, a little bit shorter, maybe a little less distinct as we come up there. So when you're doing this, consistency of the impressions as far as how far apart they are, very important. That's, that's really an important um, part of using the Vayner, really whenever you use it. It's usually used like this in a series of impressions. Rarely do you just make one whack with it and leave it at that. It's almost always going to be a series of impressions like that. Um, and you want to have a good firm grip on it, but the angle coming off there is really important. That's where we get some of the, the roundness and some of the idea that this all flows underneath into this crease. So, And on this kind of stuff like this, obviously um, Frank Menia didn't do that on his. So uh, this is stuff I just made up, you know, I decided, you know, we have tools like this. He didn't. 
What would he have done if he'd have had tools like this? He might have used this to help capture more roundness and more depth in there. Well, yeah, doesn't that just make that pop? So then on, on the upper side, I'm probably not done with that tool. I don't know if I am or not. But on the upper side of that, kind of going opposite that, I'm going to use this other one that's smooth. My, my, my uh, what did I call it? A shell tool. What number was that? Oh, that shell tool is a 748. That would be a V748 if they were some of the newer ones. I, my, a lot of my tools just have numbers on them. You know what that means? It means they're really old. The uh, craft tool, when they first started out, that's all they were doing to identify their tools was to put a just a number on it. Well, in fact, the very first ones didn't even have that. But they started putting numbers on them, and then about 1963, they started putting the letters in front of it to help folks realize a V meant vainer. Um, and uh, so that's that kind of identity. When you see some that don't have any letter in front of the number, it tells you that it's at least from 1963 or older. And did you know I have a bunch of tools? I have a lot of tools. In fact, I have a complete set of these craft tools with no letters in front of the numbers, which is right at 600 tools. I have the complete set of original craft tools. And they're really good tools. They're really good tools. And I have. Zinc. I know. Not. Yes, at one time there were. All of that depends on how old they are and when they were made. Were they made in this country, made in Taiwan, made in China? Depends. There's a lot of depends. It depends. You know, this the fact says craft tool doesn't mean anything. Um, no, those. Which one is that? Is that?